because I was uncertain, I was already at the age of 15, and my sexual life was absolutely non-existent. Although I knew a lot about what I was reading in books, like a very well-known author, Arthur Schnitzler, who, who wrote uh, The Rings. And, you know, like you get to know a lot about by reading about, but mainly uh, heterosexual sex. So I had very little idea about gay sex. Although I always found it I like to look at men, but not in a sexual way, because I was fairly young. What year is this? That is 1945. I had brothers, but they were never with me, so I had very little chance to talk about their girlfriends or whatever. But when I was in Bucharest, I had a friend, and we decided to go to Bordello. And because I slow go dancing a lot, uh, I loved it at that time I used to go dancing. I saw a girl which I rather liked. But you know, like you don't know who the person is, it doesn't matter. So he and I decided to go to the Bordello. And I was only very, nobody knew, my parents didn't have that clue, but no one. And uh, lo and behold, there she is. And I thought to say, there's an acquaintance. You know, you don't have an idea of these sort of things because as far as they are concerned, they divide their lives between their personal life and their busy life. But they eventually, I pick her and I say, I saw you dancing. And she, oh yeah, where did you see one? There they, oh yeah, go very often. Oh yes, I do. But eventually they went through the sexual uh, act quite normal. I enjoyed it. And it was winter time. And usually what they say is one hour. Being naive, I thought it's a full 60 minutes. When I stayed there, she said, well, aren't you going? She said, I said, well, it's one hour. She said, when you come, when you go, that's the hour. <laughs> but I didn't have at a time a proper idea about homosexuality or gay life. I had uh, a friend, and not a friend, it was a, when I did my apprenticeship, it was a guy, he was absolutely beautiful. And he sort of took me under his wings. And he used to take me to the communal bath, not to have sex with me, but to have me around me. It was like a protector, without any sexual connotation. But he always liked me around him. I wasn't sure what was the purpose. But in the bath, I noticed that a lot of men getting together. Nobody ever touched me. I came close. I was pretty, I don't know. But when I came to Vienna, again the same thing happened. But he, on the other hand, when I went to the communal bath, it was a different story. You did have people, who, men who go after men, and that was the first time I met a man who was serious about me. What I didn't realize is when he introduced himself later that he was an officer in the Austrian army. And he fell in love with me. I was very young, and he would have been in his thirties. But he was one of the first with whom I had more or less a serious man-to-man -man relationship. And when I had to leave Vienna, he used to come across the border on the weekends just to spend time with me. But again, that didn't really matter to me a lot because I thought it's a passing phase. So when I came to Australia, many of these things were still new to me. And again, Bondi Pavilion, where I went there, I used to like very much gymnastics. And they had parallel bars and a few bars to, uh, to do gymnastics. 
and I remember they did a few gymnastic turns and one guy, he was very handsome, he said, here is an orange. I couldn't speak a bloody word of English, but I thought, what are you doing? Giving me an orange? I said, no thank you. But we later on got to know each other, he became very good friend. I know him even today. He came from New Zealand, was absolutely handsome. So, my sexual life in Australia was also very dicey because I met some women I had sex with and we became very good friends. Didn't go to the serious part of going to get married. It was just opportunity, sexual encounter, friendship. That was it, but nothing specific. But I got to learn also that, so other Australian guys, that I can, I'm attractive enough to them, and they, uh, they wanted to have sex with me. And I went along, I sort of learned as I went. And the 50s was a very exciting time because everything was forbidden at that time. And uh, the only place you could meet was in the pubs, like at the cross, where it used to be the Rex Hotel. Martin Place was the Australia Hotel, very well standardized hotel. A few hotels in the city where you could meet and it was almost like a party. And then you sort of either paired off or somebody said, I'm having a party at home. Now again, it was a very dicey time because even though you may have had a party in your home, you had to be very discreet. So you had to shut the door, get your grog in and party. And also I met people at a time where I used to do my bushwalking, the very gay people. We used to go very often to National Park down the south coast. And again, we used to have parties. Because you had to walk, it was very difficult for the authorities to get through. So what do I bring? Bring Nelly. Nelly was cheap wine mm. because he brought Nelly you had enough wine and what we used to do we had all sort of performances my performance was done in a yard of feathers <laughs> look at that I mean yeah but you know life was really full but you had to be careful and cautious it was so restricted that even if they suspected you, if let's say your landlady saw that you had a man in here, and she tell, told the police you'd be in trouble. And I mean in trouble. And this until I met my boyfriend, my at that time I was still going with an Austrian woman. I was really, uh, when I look back, I performed both ways, at what you call bisexual. I didn't have the, uh, I didn't go f very serious with anybody because it was a time where really you flirted with a lot more people and you have the opportunity, it's really, uh, because it's forbidden, you want to do as much as you possibly can. What sort of year are we talking now? We talk about the 50s. And how old would you have been? I would have been already in the 20s. So around 1958, I met uh, Herbie, who became my partner. Our initial meeting was a very casual one. However, he liked me and I liked him. But he made a remark which wasn't very pleasing to me because it was a sort of an anti-Semitic remark. And I said to him, I don't think we'll get along because I'm Jewish and you're German. 
he apologized and then he rang me up and he said I want to see you and we slowly got together again and so our relationship started it lasted for 38 years it's a long time but his life was also a very wasn't a very good life his mother used to farm him out to farms. She lived in Bremen and she used to like to drink. The only time she looked for him is when on, coming on Fridays to collect his pay to use for drinks. He was sort of semi-literate, but otherwise he was an exceptional person. He was very friendly, very extroverted, and then he was also very talented by doing tapestries and knitting wonderful things. He worked on a waterboard and virtually everybody liked him. And we decided, he asked me to come and live with him. I lived at a cross at a time and I said I'd find him a place and I found him here in boarding house, a room and after a while he said there's a vacancy I want you to come and live here and so we lived together went to separate rooms <laughs> very prim and proper <laughs> until one evening we were sitting there with the landlady and the landlord and we were just talking and then she said sort of jokingly would you like to buy the house I said love to but in those days if you're single and at least to get any money, nobody give you money. But at the same time, I already bought a block of land, so I had a solicitor who knew me. And uh, then I said to him, look, if you buy a uh, house, you have to sort of change your life. You can't go spending money as you did. You have to sort of account for everything. She says, <laughs> one bit. But anyway, we did eventually buy the house and uh, we didn't regret it. We did uh, learn a lot of do-it-yourself, which most of the thing you see is a do-it-yourself. And uh, we also changed our social life. He didn't like very much gay people around me. For some obscure reason he thought, I've got flirty eyes, <laughs> which is not true. You believe me. I believe you. <laughs> and we did have actually uh, a lot of Jewish people coming in mainly, playing cards. The house used to be always full and they loved him. They loved him because he was a kind of person who made jokes, who was very sympathetic, very helpful to people. And even when he died, they put uh, special ads in the Jewish paper, uh, like obituaries, which was very moving for me, that it did have so much affection. When did he when die? He died in 93. He died suddenly he had an enlarged ventricle I didn't know much about it that angered me with the doctor whether it could be done something about it and he was driving down Liverpool Street you know that big you know we're going to turn and next moment he just looked and I said where are you going because we're going towards I think it's Riley Street, the bottom of it, isn't it? Very busy one. So what I did, I grabbed the, I couldn't use the brakes. I had only the hand brakes, so I grabbed the wheel, turned it towards the buildings. And I thought there were about five trees, little trees, which came down. And I thought, whatever happens, we're going to get the car into the wall and then I've sort of pulled the handbrake and halfway sort of stopped 
I remember the there was an officer across the road and they came rushing out and they grabbed him so fast to give him mouth to mouth but he was already dead, had a heart uh, failure and when the police said, he said, I'll tell you what, I admire what you did. I said, what could I do? It said, yes, I couldn't put my hand on the brakes. I, yeah, I couldn't even see. You know, like you normal, the hand didn't come off the wheel. It means, you know, like, because at the time, just before Christmas, we used to have Christmas here for a lot of people, called the Jewish Christmas. Most of the people were Jews, but they had a Christmas tree with chocolates for the kids and turkey and all. All they had, you know. And I said to him, he was already retired, I said, I don't want you to do because he was always very nervous. Want you know, it's a time of the year where you want to do everything as best as you possibly can. I said, look, you've done enough for all these years. I said, it's about somebody else to do it. I said, go, take it easy. But he didn't want to, and that was one thing that I regretted it. That, I, you know, sometimes we have a feeling of guilt, and that's what I still have, that I should have let him do, but he would not have been able to do when it. When you were going out, what kind of bars did you go to? Bars? Bars? I've been joking. They never let me go to the bar. Never. Man, he was very protective. He was absolutely. Because you were flirting. I did nothing of the sort. Look at me. <laughs> You're innocent. I tell you, do I flirt with people? <laughs> Say yes. No. <laughs> no, I didn't. You know, I'm a very, I put it in this way. I talk to people. I like people. Probably. Because when I build a, I build a house mm -hmm. over the mountain. And I said to him once, we had, you know, you have a bit of a fight. I said, you know what, you can keep panicking and I'm moving up. I said, you know what, in an hour I'll be up there. I said, do you don't want me? You know, you put that drama on. Mm -hmm. You don't want me. <laughs> Go on. I'll do. No, but it was a very good look. It's a long time. And again, uh, my family, my parents uh, left uh, for Israel in the 50s because at the time apparently Ceausescu was given a lot of money to allow many of these elderly people to leave and they went to Israel. I, then I found out that the two brothers who were in the quarry, again they escaped they made their way to Constanza, I would explain, that is the port at the Black Sea, and with other young men that tried many boats to take him to uh, Israel at the time. But many of their boats were returned by the British. Mm -hmm. So it was you had to continue to get out. But eventually they made it to Israel so in 1948, they were during the, in the, the independence day of Israel, when Israel fought for its independence. And one of my brothers, he got hurt. I was at 48, I was still, I think I went to Vienna, because at a time, there was an easing I don't know how I got there, but because once the state of Israel has been declared, they exhumed Theodor Herzog, who was the initiator of the Zionist movement. And I remember being in the cemetery in Vienna and watched that because it was a, to have your own state, Israel, for thousands of years, being the football of the nation, Israel has become an independent nation. So it was quite a celebration. But I didn't want to go to Israel for two reasons. The important reason was I realized that I'm gay, in a way. I 
always loved my parents and I respected my parents. And there's something people of this old fashioned people like that, uh, very hard to say. I didn't want to hurt them in any way. They expect you to have to marry. They expect you to have grandchildren for them. This is the normal expectation of a parent. And I couldn't do it. And that was one of my decisions to leave Europe, to go away. But I think they knew, once they knew that I lived with another man, they had a very good clue. And usually you get a lot of gossip. Mm. People telling her, you know, how about your son and all that. But I never had a direct confrontation. Mm. I only knew when I saw him first. We never discussed it. But deep in my heart I knew that I knew. They knew I have a friend. So one time I brought him with me and they liked him very much. In fact, they liked him more than they liked me. They said, where's Herbie when I came another time? And he wasn't with me. I said, well, he's working. I said, you go back and him. Because he was that type of person. And the people he met there, I'm not kidding, it was people mainly from concentration camps with marks on their finger. And if anybody would have uh, rage and, and hatred, these would be the people which who could not fault him for being. Because he was German and he wasn't Jewish either. And he was, he was German. But the way he talked about his behavior was very German. I mean, we all talk in German. So there was no uh, misunderstanding. But first of all, they knew he's with me and they knew me. So whether the the and he was he was very well received because of his character. He wasn't educated or something. He wouldn't be able to declaim poetry the way I did or talk about classic or classic music. Not none at all. But he was a person of goodwill, a person who was always a very happy person. He had those blue eyes. Which always sort of light up any time I came to light up. But and then, then he went by himself. I was always worried. You know, you never know who you're meeting, and I couldn't blame the people. And I wrote to my brother, look after, look after Herbie. I feel wonderful. I have a toil. He's he. He's your partner? No, he's my caring. caring. I only like when he has a smile. His frowns are terrible. <laughs> no, I love Fatoya. He's, he's wonderful. And I'm, I'm very fortunate and I'm very lucky that Fatoya is with me. He's been with me now nine years. Yeah. So there you are. An old crow like me. <laughs> a broken down old crow. But anyway. But I, I think of life as something very substantial. When I look at the news, and I think what people do in the name of one thing or another, it's just frightening. It gives me cold shivers that you do not appreciate what you have around you. You do not. Because that's the truth, what it is. Cities are being smashed to smithereen, and I think, why? What are you gaining? What is the gain of it? When I look at many of the news pieces, and people are lying, why? Why can't it be a bit of truth, I think? In any time I went overseas and come back, I'm grateful for Australia too, because it's a good country, and you've picked very good. <laughs>